Hello everyone, welcome to PMFIS Current Affairs Prelims Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is about the test number 5 which, which was conducted on 19th of the March. So this is your part number 1 and we'll be discussing uh, the first 20 questions of this particular test which, had, which must had offered you a lot of varieties especially in terms of your history uh, knowledge, in terms of your polity knowledge as well. So let us get started and let's see how these uh, uh, questions should have been attempted if they were to come in the upcoming UPSC exam. But before we begin guys, uh, here is another reminder for all the UPSC aspirants out there. If you have still not checked out one of the finest test series for the upcoming prelims, then please do check out our test series which is now available at a very special price of 499 and where you are going to get 10 very high quality tests which is going to contain almost 1000 MCQ. So make sure guys that you check out the test series and the entire uh, uh, content. Link is given in the description below. So stay tuned with us and uh, let's get started with the video. The very first uh, topic that we have to discuss, the very first question was with respect to uh, Chhat Puja. I'm sure many of you are already aware about this very very famous uh, festival that, that uh, is celebrated in uh, northern part of India. So what exactly you are, you are supposed to learn from the Chhat Puja because see this festival is quite clear. It's very famous one. And uh, why this particular question? <clears throat> because you see uh, festivals is one of the core topics that you have to prepare for your art and culture. And UPSC, uh, it's, it's a trend after a few years UPSC definitely ask you the questions with respect to the festivals. So you never know that uh, this time Chhat Puja can be one such question. But before we begin, here are some of the important things that you have to keep in your mind with respect to Chhat, Chhat Puja. It's a four day Hindu festival and this festival is all about uh, honoring the sun. Like the people, they offer a lot of lots and lots of uh, their prayers to the sun. The best part of this uh, Chhat Puja is that there is absolutely no involvement of the priest because here the devotees they simply fast and pray directly to the sun because um, what they believe and the concept is very beautiful behind Chhat Puja because these people believe that the sun is like a god and god like sun shines equally on everyone so we do not need anybody in between it's a direct connection of us and the sun where exactly this is celebrated so this chhat puja is celebrated in the states of bihar very prominently in bihar and some other parts like eastern up jharkhand chhattisgarh mp and of course some of the uh, parts of nepal that border bihar but bihar is the most prominent uh, location where you find the chhat puja that too at a very grand scale <clears throat> Now if you, if you uh, come to the question, so very clearly you can eliminate the option number 2 because clearly this state is, this festival is uh, celebrated in the state of North India. So these states clearly has nothing to do with Chhat Puja. Eliminate number 2, first and the third one are absolutely correct. So answer is going to be only 2. Now talking about the level of the question, I think this is easy because Chhat Puja is very very famous. And 99% of us know that this puja belongs to northern parts of India. So if you are not even sure about which particular uh, uh, states, if you, if you have a basic idea and you can eliminate the option number 2 because this is not something we have learned or heard in the southern regions, right? So this was a very easy one. I am sure many of you must have attempted this question that too in a correct way. <clears throat> that takes us to the question number 2. And the second question was with respect to the lab grown diamonds. Very interesting concept, very very important concept in fact, especially in terms of India. Because lab grown diamond has something big to do with Indian industry, especially the, the jewel industry and the export sector. How? Let's first try to understand. So this is the core uh, uh, topic which we have to focus upon for this. Now if you, if you uh, learn certain things about the lab grown diamond as the name says they are lab grown right lab grown means they are supposed to be synthetic they are supposed to be artificially manufactured diamonds but how do we prepare it now this is something very interesting normally you know diamond is a is the is a form of carbon um, but 
in the labs we can manufacture artificially we manufacture the diamonds where we use uh, all we we try to duplicate all the conditions for naturally that are required for diamond to form like especially in terms of high pressure and high temperature now in terms of lab grown diamonds interestingly once they are prepared using the artificial lab method though they they consist of the actual carbon atoms and uh, everything is just the replica of the natural one in fact they are so precise they are so amazing that they have all they have the same optical and chemical properties as the natural diamonds in fact since they are they can be manufactured in the laboratory and uh, you don't really have to depend on the raw or natural diamonds these lab grown diamonds are having huge applications literally these are used in sectors like the computer chips satellites 5g networks even they are used as heat sinks in the advanced computers they are used for grinding drilling polishing you know all these kind of industries in fact they are utilized for uh, for telecommunication and the laser optics optics so please understand despite the fact they are not natural but they are nowhere less than the use that natural diamonds uh, you know they offer talking about the lab grown diamonds in indian context if you see in india these lab grown diamonds have a share of approximately 2 to 3 percent so we are really having very low share in terms of if you if you talk about the global scale in india these lab grown uh, uh, you know diamonds are used only for jewelry and exports now interestingly guys of the total uh, share of the global globally uh, these uh, you know lab grown diamonds india produces 25% diamonds of course we are not we don't have the uh, the reservoirs of the diamond basically india relies on uh, you know on the import of the raw diamonds and we are the champions of polishing that and then exporting it but when it comes to lab grown diamonds india has a huge huge dominance of the total look uh, lab grown diamonds india is producing 1/4 25% and again india is also the largest producer of this because what method we are using for the lab grown uh, diamond the method that india uses is chemical vapor decomp deep, uh, deposition method now do expect a separate mcq on this method as well for example the upsc may ask you chemical vapor deposition method is used in which of the following uh, for which of the following purposes so now you have the answer oh this method is used for the lab grown diamond this is interesting now please understand uh, if you look at the statement number 3 now 80% of the cut and the polish uh, lab grown diamonds that we have in india we we are actually using it and growing this for the export purpose only 20% such lab grown artificial diamonds are consumed in india locally but 80% are for the purpose of exports okay and please understand there are a lot of benefits that we have uh, when we have lab grown diamonds for example such diamonds are going to be of greater purity they are going to have improved quality best part you can you can actually uh, you know make diamonds which which are more affordable they can be made in more environment friendly method they are going to be sustainable of course uh, we are we are going to have a guilt free composition because this is something we can customize as per our requirement and as per our desire so this is going to be a win win situation for everyone if you look at the question <clears throat> this question number 2 uh, specifically the statement number second is wrong because we just have understood when it comes to lab grown diamonds first statement being correct india's share is not more than 10% india's share is somewhere 2 to 3% so india has a long way to go uh, in terms of uh, growing it more and more uh, in terms of the diamond share that we have in india 20% of the cut uh, they are exported no 20% are locally used because we are using it for export purposes more 80% are exported and 20% are locally so this these facts are interchanged so you can eliminate this number 2 number 2 and number 3 yes fourth is correct they are going to be more friendly so i'm sure for many of you out there this is a new concept and i hope you have learned a lot about uh, this lab grown diamonds right okay <clears throat> now if you look at the question 
and if you look at the options available i would say this question was a medium level question because you see first of all you can't expect india to uh, have a share of a more than 10% it's still this technology is still a name technology india of course india has been a traditional uh, player in terms of diamonds uh, india has a huge market in uh, the surat is the diamond city that we have and uh, of course india has a dominance in the diamond market but when it comes to such artificial diamonds we are not that fast to cope up with all these things right so yeah the share is less than 10% so i think this statement was a very clear one you could have eliminated it anyway now please understand <clears throat> when it comes to the diamond production you know in india diamonds are not into demand as high as gold in india still we are not consuming diamond at a higher rate right diamonds are mostly for the export purposes because you don't see people getting crazy for diamonds in india the the market size locally is still not that evolved which is like the way we are exporting the diamonds right so this also logically could have been eliminated so i think this particular statement this question was an easy one considering that you have options to eliminate if you are in a position to eliminate the question becomes really simple for you guys right now talking about the diamond industry so yes you there are few facts that you guys uh, should remember with respect to diamonds uh, india is world's largest cutting and polishing center with the surat in gujarat is the global hub for the diamond manufacturing like i told you the best part about indian diamond business is india accounts for more than 90% polished uh, diamonds is that's that's manufactured in india this is insane this is huge of the total manufacturing manufactured diamonds india is the one accounting for 90% of the polished one of course we we always import the raw one and we are expert in cutting and polishing the diamonds right to further boost up the sector indian government has has permitted a 100% fdi in this particular sector and that through automatic route that's the way we are going to boost it and uh, yes majority of the diamonds is what we are uh, uh, consuming in terms of jewelry now that takes us to the question number 3 <clears throat> this question is with the respect to the critical minerals we already have done a few questions on critical minerals in the previous test but this question is not just with respect to india this question is talking about the lithium reserves and the cobalt reserves at a global level right and of course it has something to do with the current news lithium reserves in india so this question is very very interesting now here in this case please try to remember a few facts like for example when it comes to lithium reserves two things you need to remember with respect to the global reserves of lithium number one chile the country in south america is the world largest lithium reserves the key word is reserve okay but when it comes to production chile has still not maximized its production even having maximum reserves they are still world second largest producer because it is australia that is producing the the lithium at the largest scale today in the world this is as per 2021 data right <clears throat> now interestingly when it comes to the cobalt reserves please remember when it comes to cobalt it is the drc the democratic republic of congo having 51 sh 51% share and that too is followed by australia with a huge gap australia still 17% so there is no competition with respect to congo when it comes to cobalt reserves this is interesting after australia it is followed by cuba philippines russia and even canada when it comes to cobalt reserves in india you never know you may have a question in this respect also so it is odisha having 69% of the cobalt deposits reserves in india and that to followed by uh, jharkhand with 31% you see if you combine these two it becomes 100% so i can say that in india the cobalt is just restricted or mainly restricted to odisha and the jharkhand these are the two largest cobalt producing states of india <clears throat> now very famously in terms of lithium this is a famous term called the lithium triangle lithium triangle is basically uh, the 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 three countries so we have the we have bolivia uh, we have chile 
and we have the Argentina. So these three countries, they together make a triangle and this is considered to be the largest estimate reserves of that lithium in the world. These are some estimates, of course, not every resource is mobilized yet, but yeah, if you consider the reserves of Bolivia, Chile and Argentina, all the three countries from South America, that comes out as the largest estimated resources, especially when it comes to lithium. In India, very recently, India has got a jackpot. In fact, lithium is sometimes called as a white gold. Why we call it, uh, it as a white gold? Because lithium reserves, we have just discovered in Jammu Kashmir and Rajasthan. So you may have a MCQ on that as well. Which of the following states, UTs of India, uh, we have recently discovered lithium in? So the answer would be JNK and Rajasthan. Now, my question to all of you, do you guys know uh, or you can tell me in the comment section box the the most famous application of the lithium as a mineral do you know where the lithium is used the most if you know the answer at least try to tell me three uses of lithium in the comment section box and what makes it so critical and so important now if you look if you go back to the question the third and the se uh, fourth statements are absolutely correct with respect to lithium triangle yes all three correct lithium reserves in Jammu Kashmir and Rajasthan. So these three and four is are correct. Be careful. It says Bolivia having the largest lithium reserves. No, it is Chile that has the reserves at a maximum level. When it comes to cobalt, clearly Australia was the second one. The first one being the DRC. So yeah, the first and second are incorrect. <clears throat> I would say this particular question was a medium one. For many, it may sound tough, but why, why, I'm, why I'm telling you because lithium is something which is so much in the news guys. Lithium is one such critical mineral which, which was in the news for the last one year. And UPSC would expect you to know a lot about this, these kind of minerals. Being critical, being in news as well. So I would say this question uh, is something you could have taken a bit of risk. Because very easily, if you are not uh, uh, you know, aware, I understand. If you are not aware about the second statement, it may have troubled many of you but at least look at the first three and four at least these three statements are something which were in news for so many reasons right so i expect you that you must take a risk because uh, you are in a position to eliminate at least one uh, you know the second third and fourth being right so yeah this way this being medium or tough can still be attempted can still be risked because um, you know the things from the scratch in this question right <clears throat> now question number four now this question I would personally say yeah this was a tough question now why I'm saying this question was a tough one because look at the statement now this question is about composite water management index right water management that is the key word and look at the first option it is published by Central Water Commission I mean if I have to do my guesswork, 99% chances are that I'm going to pick this as the right one. Whereas in fact, this is not the right one. It looks very collectible, but the reality is this index was actually published by Niti Ayuk. So that makes first being incorrect. Okay. I'm just trying to tell you the approach. Now, of course, <clears throat> there is absolutely one thing that I know for sure like for example in India we have 4% of the uh, you know uh, world's freshwater resource resources there yes so India having the largest population of the world being seventh in terms of the size of the country and having just 4% freshwater resource resources that actually make India a water uh, you know water stress country understand that makes us water stress country but but the third statement is over exaggeration of that particular point because the statement number three says that India's 70 percent population is facing water stress condition is little bit more exaggerated so I agree with three but I don't agree with uh, I agree with four I don't agree with three because if, if this would be the situation, the things could have been really worse in India. 
right so at least i have the idea about these three statements right now please look at the fact first look at the index first and then we'll come back to the question <clears throat> pardon my uh, throat is in not very good shape so it may be giving a little bit of uh, you know that sound so yes one thing we have understood so far that niti ayog is the one that has published this uh, composite water management index this index is very important because it's it's like an annual snapshot of the water sector status and especially how the indian states and union territories they are performing in terms of water management and that make this index very very special so this index is uh, like you have seen it's published by niti ayog but niti ayog releases it with cooperation or in association with ministries of jal shakti and the rural development so that make this is a very now please remember the two ministries like 90% cases wherever the water water management is concerned please remember jal shakti and ministry of rural development really work hand in hand in terms of water management right now <clears throat> of course this particular index has nine themes and the nine themes are in front of you right here so remember if you are if you are not in a position to remember all the names at least try to remember that there are nine themes of this composite water management index okay now please remember this particular index is not widely used for planning or decision making uh, purposes that is why niti ayog right now actually suggest to explore some more alternatives because ultimately managing water for india is a priority and why i am saying so look at the graph 50% of indian population right now they are facing water stress conditions not 70 but 50 is also very dangerous situation thankfully we are not till 70 but 50 itself is a very dangerous alarming situation that we have in india and we are seeing that india is actually becoming from water uh, uh, you know stress condition we are actually moving towards becoming water scare scarce condition and that is because in india there is lot of pressure on the fresh water resources in fact many survey tells in india water availability per person is going to decrease drastically by 2031 and you you have the figures in front of you so yes the situation is grim but not as grim as was shown by the question if you come back to the question once again <clears throat> now you will understand the question that this index has nine themes but this these two are wrong so only two options are correct i would say this was a tough one undoubtedly and especially this part makes it really confusing so i don't suggest you guys to take unnecessary risk because you cannot you can't guess the themes so there are more chances of this question going wrong for you i would say you should skip it because it's too factual and it's tricky as well something that can that has more chances of you putting in wrong place that takes us to, us to the question number 5 now this question is very interesting and important another one from hindustani classic music now if you look at the question <clears throat> this classical music in india we have two types of classical music right we have the hindustani music and the carnatic music carnatic music is even older than the hindustani classic music okay let's see i do not know much about it let's presume that at least i know that hindustani classic music actually is the one that belongs to the northern part of india because for the southern parts we have the carnatic music at least this much information is there look at the statement number 3 it says that this hindustani music essentially uses the compositions written in hindi punjabi braj bhasha makes sense but malayalam really malayalam has nothing to do with hindustani music malayalam is a prominent language for carnatic music so that makes my option number 3 absolutely wrong mia tanseen very very famous prominent hindustani classical musicians big name tall name we all know about it 
but then there is a problem with the first statement the origin of hindustani classical music when you think of the 16th century you must think during that time the bhakti movement was very prominent and clearly hindustani classical music is older than the bhakti movement so that that actually makes me think the first statement is going to be wrong because hindustani classical music is supposed to be older than the bhakti movement that concludes that very logical ra right? so this statement this question must be having only one option as the correct one this question was a tough one but with with a common sense and the right approach you can easily attempt it so answer has to be uh, one only one that is a i hope that all the things are clear so <clears throat> when exactly hindustan hindustani music was, was originated way back in 12th century and that was a time when hindustani classical music actually got uh, diverged from the carnatic classical music veena sitar sarod are the three prominent instruments which are used for hindustani classical music remember that and yes we already have discussed so um, mia tan sen very very famous uh, hindustani musician that we have and he was greatly influenced by sufi saint mohammad uh, uh, mohammad gos you know tansen uh, was the one who is also credited for perfecting the gwalior gharana that is one of his uh, achievements you can say in fact he was so prominent and he was so uh, you know he was a musician musical genius even akbar invited tansen to join his court uh, of musicians in the mughal court you can imagine the kind of level he had of hindustani music and yes talking about the languages so you can expect all the southern languages karnataka telugu tamil malayalam belong to carnatic music right <clears throat> even sanskrit very interestingly do remember that even sanskrit is used in carnatic now this may be a confusing point if you have in the mcq let's say but sanskrit has more connection with carnatic not in hindustani hindustani actually uses urdu as one of the prominent languages interesting you should remember it okay now uh, we have the next option which is um, which is question number 6 is with respect to international migration outlook report a very interesting report but again very careful the question is asking you which statement is not correct so first let's understand the report and then we'll come back to the question and the approach talking about the report international migration outlook very first thing which has which organization has released it oecd organization for economic cooperation and development is india a member of oecd no please remember it right now india not a member of oecd oecd actually belongs to those country or it's a group of those country having more uh, high standard of living having more per capita gdp kind of stuff so india is not part of oecd but oecd is the one uh, releasing this report on migration talking a little bit more of the oecd it's a group of 38 countries uh, these countries uh, they founded this group way back in 1961 and the purpose as the name says economic cooperation and development so the main purpose of the oecd was to push to stimulate the economic progress along uh, and the world trade as well having its headquarter in paris that's a very uh, important point plus oecd members are those which are having very high not just high but very high human development index and they are high income economies so clearly india is not a part of it something you have to remember with respect to the report international migration report as per the report oecd countries received more than 60 lakh permanent immigrants in 2022 and you and that explains why people and the illegal migrants why they are moving towards the oecd countries because of the high level income more high development index right human development index and india in this situation in 2022 
India was also in the list, but not in the list of immigrants. But India was the largest migration source to these OECD countries. And the reasons which are prescribed is mainly the family migration. That is one of the primary category uh, in which maximum number of Indians were moving to OECD countries. When it comes to uh, highest number of refugees, uh, uh, you know, which country has hosted? So Germany, Poland and US are the three countries. They have hosted the highest number of refugees from Ukraine in absolute terms. <clears throat> Pardon. So I hope you are clear with this. Uh, all the three statements, right? Now, if you come back to the question, yes, you know, the first option being not correct. This is the one being not correct and other two being actually correct. The answer has to be one. So uh, do we have anything to guess in that? Well, guys, I think the first one, you can't really guess. That makes this question tough because you think of international migration report. I'm very sure you are going to think about international organization of migration. This statement looks correct and there is absolutely no clue that makes this question very difficult. If by chance, if there is any student who, ha who has read about the OECD reports, then the question becomes really easy because the way, uh, the moment you would have eliminated these, then you could have get the other options being two and three are the, the right ones. But unfortunately, this is little tough. I would say you can take a risk if you know this much information and if you are in a position to eliminate at least these uh, statement, then you can take a risk for sure. <clears throat> okay, that takes us to the next question number seven. Very interesting question on El Nino. We all know about El Nino a lot because we have read a lot about the El Nino, uh, especially in terms of and it's about the connection that El Nino has with our Indian monsoon. Start with that logic, start with that knowledge. Look at statement number two first. It says during the El Nino, Indian subcontinent witness surplus monsoon. We really wish that would have happened, but no. El Nino has the negative effect on Indian monsoon. It suppresses Indian monsoon. So statement two is clearly wrong. I'm not saying that El Nino is always going to be detrimental for the monsoon. There are some situations like for example, even if there is El Nino year, but during that year, if you have a positive Indian Ocean dipole, you may have good rainfall, good monsoon, but that is very rare condition. So in general, in totality, El Nino suppresses, dissipates a negative effect on our monsoon rains. So two being wrong. Look at the first question, look at the first statement. It says, we know, we know few things about El Nino. Very first thing, very basic thing, we, it's, a, it's a warm ocean current, right? And where does it appear? It actually replaces the Peru current. It replaces the Peru current, which is a cold ocean current. So we know very clearly where is the Peru and where, where is, where is the, the western uh, part of the South America uh, as a continent that that becomes the eastern boundary of uh, our Pacific Ocean, uh, right? <clears throat> now, interestingly, if you look um, at the first statement, so El Nino is a climate pattern. Yes, it is causes warmer than ever sea surface, yes. In fact, it can raise the temperature by replacing the Peru. Now, if you look at the South America, in normal conditions, you have this Peru current. Humboldt, Peru current is also called the Humboldt current. But during the El Nino years, yes, it is being replaced by the El Nino current. And El Nino is in a position to raise the temperature by up to five to five and a half degree Celsius. That much temperature can raise. And that's exactly why the problem happens. Because of the surface temperature rise, the entire walker cell becomes a modified walker cell. Normal walker, you have the flow going uh, in the opposite direction. From South America to Australia, that is the kind of flow the winds are having. But during the El Nino, there is a reversal that happens. During the El Nino, the winds going from Australia to South America, and you see everything is just reversed. This is called the modified walker cell. So yes, it is going to appear in central and eastern Pacific and everything is correct. 
So first being correct, second is wrong. Answer is C. I think very easy question because L Nino itself is very famous. And I'm sure many of you must have attempted this question without any trouble. And here's a diagram in front of you. You can see the positioning and, and one more thing. Now you would say, sir, El Nino appears in Pacific Ocean. It is impacting Indian Ocean. Yes, because El Nino is a part of ENSO and ENSO being one of the teleconnections, right? Teleconnection, that you have the connection between atmosphere and the ocean. And despite the distance, these global phenomena are somehow related to each other. That's a part of teleconnections. <clears throat> okay. Uh, talking about the, uh, the question number eight. Now it says, which of the following statement is correct? Now this, this particular question is from history where it talks about two very prominent movements. One uh, movement is the Dioban movement, another being the Aligarh movement. Both are very, very important movements. Now, first let's learn about them and then we'll come back. The very first statement it says about the, um, now remember the two. So first let's talk about the Aligarh movement. Aligarh and Dioban are actually the, you know, the opposite cornerstones. Why? Aligarh movement was actually a liberal modern kind of movement that emerged among the Muslims intelligentsia. And this movement was based in Muhammad, uh, Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College. Why it is called liberal and modern trend? Because this movement, this the ideology of uh, the, the followers of this uh, movement, they had a belief in ideology which was based on the liberal interpretation of the Quran. So the basic aim of this movement was to spread the modern education among the Indian Muslims. Okay. But if you look at the Dioband movement, very opposite in character. Aligarh being liberal, Dioband being orthodox. And the agenda behind Dioband was basically the it was a revivalist movement. It just the major objective was keeping the keeping alive the spirit of jihad against the foreign rulers. So I hope these two set the tone for the rest of the question. Now, very careful. Um, on the political front, Dioban school actually welcomed the formation of Indian National Congress. Yes, they does. Because uh, they thought that, you know, it's going to be good for their agenda as well. Dioban movement, because you know, you have already learned, Dioban was an orthodox uh, movement, not a liberal one. So, Dioban movement actually propagated uh, upon the pure teachings of Quran and Hadith among the Muslims. Whereas the Aligud was about the you know liberal interpretation of Quran. But for Dioban, what is there? It is there. And in all the orthodox method, they were trying to, uh, you know, they were trying to interpret that. So clearly you see the option number one and two are incorrect because both are interchanged. We just have learned Aligarh being liberal. Dioban being orthodox, keeping the spirit of jihad alive. Third is correct. The fourth one is again not correct. So yeah, this question was a medium one. I think this could have been uh, taken a bit of risk because both um, uh, movements are quite famous. And uh, you have the option. Uh, and Aligarh, if you're not very, if you're not very aware of about the Dioban, I think Aligarh is quite famous. That can help you eliminate at least option number B and D. And if you have this kind of situation, you can still take a risk because uh, the options are quite limited in this uh, front. <clears throat> the next question again from history. Uh, this question talks about the uh, Birsa Munda, very, very famous cult personality, I would say this person was. And which statement was correct? Now, very interestingly, you should learn a bit of facts about Birsa Munda. He was a young freedom fighter and uh, at the same time, he was a tribal leader and uh, he belonged to which tribe? The Munda tribe. That's why the name Birsa Munda. Now, very interestingly, while he, and he was very young, very, very young. In fact, he died at the age of 25, you can imagine. Despite being so young, 
Birsa declared himself as a god and he preached his religion literally among the Mundas, his followers. In fact, thousands and thousands of Munda, when became his followers, the followers used to call themselves as Birsait. That's the kind of uh, impact he used to have. In fact, he used Hindu and Christian item, uh, items to create the Munda ideology and the worldview. And yes, while he was doing all that, while he was preaching his religion, very, very important, Birsa Munda advocated the prohibition of the cow slaughter because we are talking about something that was happening in 18th, 19th century. Now, very interestingly, you know that in 2000, when the three new states uh, were carved, uh, carved out on the map of India, Jharkhand was one of those states. In uh, When Jharkhand was uh, created, it was actually created on the birth anniversary of Birsa Munda. That's the kind of, uh, you know, recognition his movement had on nas at national level. You can understand his still being a cult personality in the state uh, of Jharkhand, right? Upon his uh, call, the Birsa Munda revolt started against, uh, against the landlords, against traders, merchants, government officers. Basically, uh, the whole revolt was against the outsiders. And what these people used to call outsider, the name was Dikkus. They used to call outsider as Dikkus. And against all these outsiders, Birsa Munda led the revolt uh, right from 1895 to 1901. Unfortunately, uh, he was captured at the age of 25. In fact, in jail, he died at the age of 25 as well, where he was captured two, three months back. Right? Now, very interesting story of Birsa Munda and his struggle. Now, if you look at the question, yes, all the four statements look perfectly okay without an issue. Very, very famous moment in terms of uh, modern India. All four easy, correct. My suggestion, guys, do read about all the civil movements, all the peasant movements, all the tribal movements. These, all these kind of movements are very, very important for your prelims. In fact, a lot of questions will come from these peasant movement, tribal movement and the civil movements. Very, very famous one. So do and Birsa Munda is one such that you have in your test. That takes us to the question number 10. And why this question is so important? Because this question talks about Mahatma Jyoti Rao Phule. Very cult personality again from the state of Maharashtra. Why so cult? Please understand. Jyoti Ba Phule, few things you need to remember. Jyoti Ba Phule was actually born in a low caste Mali family, uh, which used to be considered at a very low level in the hierarchy of the caste among the Hindus at that time. Jyoti, ba, Jyoti Rao Phule, also known as Jyoti Ba Phule, he was fully aware, he was very well aware about the kind of social discrimination that was there for non-Brahmins and untouchables in Maharashtra. And that is why when he became, uh, you know, a powerful voice, he challenged the caste discrimination at a very first instance. And he always, throughout his life, he propagated the equality. He proposed that Shudras, the laboring caste, and Ati Shudras, untouchables, they all should unite to challenge this caste discrimination. Now, very famously, Jyoti, Rao, Jyoti Ba Phule, for, for his purpose of uh, challenging the caste discrimination and to propagate the child caste equality, he founded an association called as the Satya Shodak Samaj. That was his uh, association that he started. Now, you know, he wrote many books. To champion his cause, Jyoti Bhai Phule has written many, many books. Some of the names are in front of you, where it includes Gulam Giri, very, very famous one. And other being the, uh, the Brahmanach Kesab, the Sarvajan, Janik, Satya Dharm, Satsar, very, very famous books, all of them. Do you know that not just the caste equality, he was also a pioneer in terms of women education in Maharashtra. He, along with his, his wife, Savitri Bhai Phule, they started India's first school for girls at the Bhede Wada in Pune. 
and you must know that even jyotiba phule was given the title mahatma by the social worker called vithal rao krishna ji one day kar and this was a huge thing at the time for his effort for the kind of things that he had done he was given the title mahatma come back to the question once now talking about the question guys very interesting question this question every statement is absolutely correct you have everything in front of you making the answer as d all medium question medium but very easy why because and 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 you must know one best part he was if you know just one part that he was actually uh, he was the guide or guru or mentor you can say kind of mentor or guru of bhim rao saab ambedkar if you know this fact rest many of these you can do the guess work easily mahatma jyotira uh, like ambedkar was very influenced from uh, the efforts and the work of jyotira phule so you can see everything gets in place because we know ambedkar more so we are in a position to connect all the facts about mahatma uh, jyotiba phule as well so i think that makes this question really really easy so <clears throat> okay uh, this was the first 10 questions that we have discussed guys i hope everything is clear so far so uh, i am stopping this video at this first 10 questions because i think uh, because of this uh, voice uh, i should take a break and then continue because uh, with this voice i should not continue it will give uh, learners a bad experience so let's take a break here and then we'll start with the rest of the questions so i'm taking a short break here okay now that takes us to the question number 11 and this question was with respect to the personalities and their contribution now this is a very interesting question because upsc uh, especially in terms of history uh, upsc is very fond of asking these kind of questions so the four personalities that were given was baba gurudev uh, guru nanak ji uh, guru tegh bahadur again a very prominent uh, sikh uh, guru uh, then we have lachit uh, borfukan and kazi nazrul islam now you see this question was uh, it, it appeared to be tough one but it was not actually very i mean hardly there is anybody who does not know about the 10 uh, sikh gurus right so guru nanak ji being the first one and uh, guru tegh bahadur another important uh, sikh guru and in sikhism we know that uh, guru granth sahib is the is uh, what we call you know now, right now it's a it's a living guru uh, you know after 10th guru there is no guru further and guru granth sahib today their uh, holy literature their their uh, religious literature uh, is what we call as the living guru guiding the path and this is a compilation of all the teachings of their 10 gurus so very clearly lachit borkufan has a history in assam right so clearly this personality has nothing to do with guru granth sahib so at least i am in a position to eliminate the option number 2 if option 2 is incorrect then be careful about other statements at least you know that sarai ghat is a very famous battle which was fought by one of the assom uh, ahom uh, kings that that is uh, present day assam so clearly guru tegh bahadur has nothing to do with the with the battle against moguls in the sarai ghat in sarai ghat the battle was with respect to lachit borkufan at least i can eliminate these 2 and 4 and then we have the option 1 and 3 being the correct one right i mean this is the way we can eliminate the things in this question if it was a tough one or not we'll come back to the later first try to understand the basics about these four personalities when you think about guru nanak dev ji um, well he was born in talwandi which is present day in pakistan and uh, he is the one who founded sikhism somewhere in the late 15th uh, uh, century and he was the first of the 10 gurus that you know very very importantly very interestingly he believed in unity of the good head godhead and the brotherhood of mankind and even today sikhism is all built up on these two strong pillars 
at on one hand where he condemned the mean, meaningless rites and rituals on the other hand he preached belief in only one god and to actually put his teaching into practice he started very interestingly twin institutions that is sangat and pangat even in today's sikhism the sangha that means congregation and pangat that is the community free uh, the free community kitchen which is called langar also i am sure you must have heard the word langar so these two are still very important uh, institution that we have we can see if you go to any gurdwara you can always going to see these two very prominently now that was the important traits for guru nanak ji why it is important see in uh, in this uh, year gs paper 4 there was a direct question on the teachings of guru nanak dev and guru gobind like you know these kind of questions were directly there in the in the exam so that makes these kind of questions very prominent for your upcoming exams talking about uh, the a uh, homes that is present day assam and uh, there was a general lachit uh, borfukan and he defeated moguls in the battle of sarai ghat that uh, made him very famous and it was a naval battle that was fought way back in 8 uh, 1671 between the british uh, the, between the moguls and the home kingdoms and this battle of uh, sarai ghat was actually fought on the rivers of brahmaputra river which is present day guwahati in assam so clearly it uh, he has nothing to do with guru granth sahib you can see when you talk about guru granth sahib yes it's the guru tegh bahadur their uh, ninth sikh guru and uh, he was actually killed on the orders of mogal emperor aurangzeb uh, because he resisted the forceful conversions into islam that were taking place at that time so of course he belonged to the to the cult of sikhism talking about bengali poet kazi nazrul islam very very famous uh, uh, poet uh, he, when like he was designated as a national poet of bangladesh in Uh, 1972 uh, he was a bengali poet uh, you know and uh, he is popularly known as the rebel poet because he most of his work most of the of the kind of uh, you know creation that he had done was in the area of protest and revolution that's why he is known as the bidrohi kavi in the language of bengal and um, uh, yeah so and he, uh, these are the four points that you should remember so clearly uh this question i would say uh this question was of medium level thanks to uh, first and fourth at least we know about these two but again be very careful because it's a match the following kind of stuff and you really have to be 200% sure because you don't have anything to eliminate in terms of the options so you can take a risk but you know just be very careful with this it is it's a tough question it's a tricky question so be careful about such questions question number 12 <clears throat> talks about advocates on record i think this is one of the easiest question of the of the entire test we know about advocates on record right they are the they are those uh, advocates having exclusive right to file and argue cases in supreme court on the behalf of their clients i mean you know to be to go and file a case in supreme court to argue uh cases in supreme court it's not a it's not a small thing so there we have advocates on record they are they are exclusive lawyers exclusive advocates who have this distinction of going and do doing this stuff so this was a very easy straightforward question what else you should know about the advocates on record is something you have to be careful about now please remember you think of uh, think about advocates on record yes you must know they are there they are the essential link between the litigant and the highest court because they are the one because they are the they are the senior counsels having exclusive right to file and argue cases in supreme court remember that uh, there was a time you know before 2013 there was a time where uh, as per the supreme court rules uh, you know they can appear uh, they 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 could not appear before the court before other courts there was a time but after 2013 judgment the eligibility criteria their functionality everything changed 
and uh, right now uh, there are certain conditions if anybody wants to be advocate on record the person must have completed one year training uh, under the program of the court approved AOR must have a four year of legal practice experience before that training should have cleared the exam with the minimum 60% uh, score maintain a registered office within 16 kilometers of the Supreme Court building. So these are the few recent eligibility criteria to be a part of AOR that is important. Next question has another important uh, institution in news and that is Central Information Commission. Very very important CIC something that we all should be aware of. Now at least we know that this CIC was formulated under the RTI Act in 2005. Now since it is it was formed under an act of parliament it, it is a statutory body this much we know already right okay now very interestingly if you look at the other statements you should be aware because this this is a four statement question and the more statements give actually gives you more option to eliminate so first statement being correct we already have discussed and uh, the way we have at national level we have the CIC at the state level we have the state information commissions uh, each commission uh, you know consists of a chief election commissioner chief uh, information commissioner and they have a maximum of the 10 IC information commission that is their maximum composition please remember whenever you have to appoint anybody as CIC that appointment of a CIC is to be done by the president but not on his own will of course on the recommendation of a high power committee uh, that comprise of the prime minister the lop of the lok sabha leader of opposition and the cabinet minister which is appointed by the pr prime minister this is important recently you see this is the same committee same committee same in the sense the same uh, composition of the committee also responsible for choosing the election commission of india and the other uh, uh, election commissioners right so this is interesting and important guys uh, the chief election commissioner right the CEC now very interestingly if you look at uh, the perspective of the CIC this commission is actually responsible for receiving and investigating the individual complaints that are filed under the RTI can they do, do this on their own yes they can I mean this commission has the power to inquire into the matter suo moto on their own in fact they have a power of a civil court when it comes to uh, summoning or requiring documents or you know asking somebody to come and be a part of the file and very importantly the decisions of the CIC are final and they are binding this is the importance of the CIC that we have now very importantly and interestingly uh, do remember one thing when it comes to the salary allowances and other conditions of the service for the CIC after the amendment in 2019 all these parts salary allowances and other things shall be prescribed by the central government that is important before this amendment uh, everything was similar to the chief election commissioner but now after 2019 everything is to be decided by the central government that in my opinion somewhere diluted the autonomy the you know Kind of power of the CIC so yeah with the more government influence uh, things becomes dilute little bit I think so yes the four statement is wrong because we had just understood this was an old required old adjustment this is something which was there before 2019 now the things have changed so clearly four is wrong one is correct now please look at the statement number two I mean this is something which I everybody could have understood very well it says the committee that is going to recommend the name to the president is going to be consist of PM fine leader of opposition of Rajya Sabha do you have any selection committee I mean yeah there are few there are few but commonly if you have to call the leader of opposition in maximum cases 99% cases it is going to be from the Lok Sabha not the Rajya Sabha so clearly statement 2 is wrong when it uh, can inquire into so motor yes so 1 3 being correct 2 4 being incorrect the option was uh, the uh, the second one the b2 only 2 
the question i would so say was an was a medium uh, kind of thing and uh, i'm very sure that you guys must have attempted this with little bit of elimination and smartness so i would say something easy question uh, directly the very direct straightforward question from the book from the polity books that we all read right okay now that takes us to us to the question number 14 <clears throat> Now this question is specifically with respect to the scheduled areas. Why you should read more and more because in many news people are talking about scheduled areas, scheduled tribes, autonomous tribal councils, tribal uh, you know we have the uh, tribal committees. People are talking about fifth schedule, sixth schedule. All these topics are going to be important for your UPC exam and that's why we ask this question about the scheduled areas and that too under the fifth schedule now first try to learn about the fifth schedule and the scheduled areas and then we'll come back to the question i think everyone by by this time everyone is aware of the all the schedules that we have in constitution how many total do we have india indian constitution has 12 schedules in total the fifth schedule of our constitution deals with the administration of the administration and control of the scheduled areas and scheduled tribes within those areas. Fifth schedule has all the states covered except for Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, Mizoram because these four has a separate scheduled as a sixth schedule. We don't have to go there but focusing on the fifth schedule itself. So right now uh, the fifth, fifth schedule uh, provides the administration of the tribal areas in 10 states namely Andhra, Chhattisgarh, Gujarat, Himachal, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Odisha, Rajasthan and Telangana. This fifth schedule areas, all the fifth schedule areas are actually exempted from the panchayat related requirements that were there in the ninth part. So that, that makes these areas very special and in fact, in fact, uh, who has the power with respect to the scheduled areas please be careful when you think of scheduled areas it is the president of india who is going to, who is going to declare which particular area is the is the scheduled one or the not or not the scheduled one so all the power resides to the president of india in fact the president of india in consultation with the governor has a power to increase or decrease the area of that or alter the boundary of scheduled area maybe risk in such designation or make fresh order for such kind of redesignation. So all these powers <clears throat> reside with president but of course governor is taken into account. Please understand when, when it comes to the application of the laws to the scheduled areas the executive power of the state belongs to these scheduled areas. The governor however can direct the you know act of the parliament which are going to apply which are going to not apply but please be careful when it when you think of the fifth schedule you know for for the purpose of executives for the purpose of making laws implementing the laws protecting the interests of the tribal communities the fifth schedule has a provision of the tribe advisory council it is clearly mentioned right so all the administration of scheduled areas to be done by these tribal advisory councils under the fifth schedule. The way it has TSE under the sixth schedule we have the autonomous tribal councils for those states. Ten so, much, so far uh, you know councils we have so far interestingly. So now if you, if you look at the question and if you come back so you will find all the three statements being very very correct. And like I told you, fifth schedule, scheduled areas are very important questions to prepare. So in this case, all the three are absolutely correct, making this question a medium one. But again, the, the options are very easy to understand and something which, which is very straightforward without any twist or turns. Takes us to the question number 15. Again, a very interesting question from the pages of polity. The famous UN Debar Committee relates to not economically weaker section, not OBC, not scheduled tribe, but yes, uh, not scheduled caste, but, the, but scheduled tribes. 
many of you must be having confusion between these two but actually Debar Commission belongs to scheduled tribes. In fact, today something that we call as PVTG, PVTG is something called as particularly vulnerable tribal group. The base, the basis of the PVTG was actually put forward by the UN Debar Commission came back 1960s in India. But before I go and proceed uh, and I explain you things about the UN Debar, I want to ask you guys a very simple and important question. Can you give me the name of the committees that actually belongs to these three as well? Let's see how many, how many of you are in a position to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to tell me the comment about these three uh, committees that belongs to the other one. Because for this question, Debar belongs to this ST. But what about other one? Tell me in the comment section box. Talking more about the Debar committee, we know that this uh, has a relation to the scheduled tribes. So way back in 1960, uh, Debar, why we call it Debar committee? Because UN Debar was the was was heading and he submitted his report in 1961. Based on his report, it was uh, that, you know, the, the scheduled tribes, which area is going to be a scheduled area? To, to make sure that this area becomes a scheduled area under the fifth schedule, all the criteria were suggested by Debar, P, uh, UN Debar, very, very important. Like he specified, like which particular uh, uh, area is to be called as, the, uh, as a scheduled area. Number one, if the presence of the large tribal population is there, the compactness, reasonable size of the area is there, underdeveloped nature of the area, or some kind of disparity in people's economic safe standard compared to neighboring areas. So in that case, that area is going to be considered or called as the tribe, uh, the, the scheduled area. That makes it very, very important, guys. That takes us to the question number 16. This question number 16 is with respect to the DGP, Director General of Police of a State. Now again, you have to, sub, you have to figure out which statement is correct. Now, if you look at the question and look at the option, guys. So, when it comes to the, D, uh, the DGP, few things you have to be very careful about. Number one, it is the state government that appoints the, uh, the DGP from the top three officers. And how these top three officers are considered, everything, every appointment is to be done by a panel of empanelment committee. The committee has few members like for example this empanelment committee has UPSC chairman as a president, union uh, home secretary, state chief secretary, state G DGP and also you can think of uh, you know head of the CAPF uh, which is to be nominated by the Ministry of Home Affairs because all the CAPF is under the administrative control uh, of the MHA. Okay. Now uh, the empanelment shortlist the maximum three officers and that's how the, the you know, appointments take place. Now interestingly when it comes to the police officers, now police officers must have at least six months or more of the service before they are appointed as the DGP. That's very interesting criteria. It's, it should not be like somebody who's very close to the retirement. The DGP must have a six month or more a service time left. Interestingly, that police, any police officer to become a DGP, he or she must have at least 25 years of experience. With 10 years of experience, specifically in the areas of order, crime branch, economic offenses, IB, RAW, CBI, something like that. Something very distinguishing. That is what is uh, what, what it is important, right? And uh, as per the UPSC rules, it says the two-third fixed tenure for the for there's a two year fixed tenure for all the state uh, DGPs. So now if you look at the question guys, you will see sir at least two statements are correct. Why? Look at the statement number two. It says police officers must have one year of service before retirement. No, it should have a six month now making things even better. So second you can eliminate straightforward one and three being the correct one. So answer is to be two. Question was tough. I would suggest you to skip because not very famous and very fact based question. So no clue of guessing. It was a tough one. You could have skipped if you if you like not to take further risk. 
that brings us to the question number 17 that talks about the special category status i'm sure you must have heard the news coming from bihar a lot of time bihar assembly has passed the special category status bihar is asking about the special category status and all the blah 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 a lot of things are there now but what what about this special category status what is the meaning of a special category status first you need to learn then we'll come back to the question so this very concept something called as a special category state its introduction was done way back in 1969 on the recommendations of the fifth finance commission before that there was no concept of special category states guys remember the name of the at least the number of the finance commissions there are few finance commissions but very very important so fifth finance commission is credited to start the system of special category states Currently in India, we, there are 11 states that has this so-called tag or status of a special category status. Eight being northeastern states, uh, including the Sikkim and the three hilly region states having Jammu Kashmir, Himachal and now we have the uh, uh, Uttarakhand also. So there are 11 in general that we have. Please understand, as far as Indian constitution is concerned, it does not have any provision with respect to the special category state. In fact, this status was granted in the past by National Development Council NDC. Now it is, now it is not functioning at that level. Now we have Niti Aayog to take care of other things, right? Uh, one thing, why so many states demand special category states? Why? Because once you get this status, of course, which is based on so many logical things, not like everybody can go and ask for that. No, it's not possible. But if once you get the SCS, the center is going to pay 90% of your funds and the state government just has to contribute 60%. Also, regular states get that, that uh, funding as 60-40. Here it would be 90 is to 10. And that's why probably every government is backing upon and they're trying to you know ask for this kind of thing. So here, if you look, guys, very interestingly, was special category, was on the recommendation of third finance commission? No, on the fifth finance commission, we have understood. So if this is wrong, clearly D is also wrong. So forget about A, forget about D. Look at the last one. Do you think, do you think it is really possible that the central government has uh, more, like almost 11 special category states? Do you think the center is in position to pay 100% of the funds. It's too exaggerated, right? Doesn't seem good to be true. So yeah, answer is supposed to be B. Very, very interestingly because Indian constitution does not have anything to say. So this question, I think this was a, uh, was a tough one, but you guys could have attempted it easily or at least could have risked it easily because look at the options. Options are quite simple and straight forward right that brings us to the question number 19 which is about the uh, press council of india very important body another important pillar of uh, uh, of our polity so what what you have to learn about the press council of india let's see so a uh, few things you please try to keep this in mind number one when, th when you think of press council of india it is still a statutory body which is established under the press council of india act it's a quasi judicial body means it has a it has a lot of functions and powers uh, with respect to some kind of civil powers when when it is under the proceedings right interestingly it has quasi judicial body now talking about the press council of india how the composition works so right now uh, it has a chairman along with 28 remember the name 28 other members other than chairman we have in press council of india chairman of this press council is selected by the speaker of the lok sabha the chairman of rajya sabha and member elected by the pci the press council so yes even in this this is also a three member uh, you know it is again a three member committee that is getting selected but please remember guys for press council of india the committee is very 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 unique you know, that, that, is, that is important. Uh, the, the term of the chairman is going to be of three years. 
when it comes to the press council of india uh, interestingly that all the decisions of the press council of india are final the way we have seen in the case of cic all decisions final cannot be appealed before the court of law very interestingly please remember one thing though it it seems that press council of india has so many powers but why still it is called as a toothless tiger why because there are limitations on press council of india for example it cannot penalize the newspaper or news agencies or editor journalist no it cannot uh, penalize anybody of them violating the guidelines also second it does not have does not have the power to review or functioning of electronic medias like we have it's not their job or it does not belong to their domain so yes statement 4 is also incorrect look at the question come back start eliminating guys now you have already seen what about the composition of press council of india is it about chairman and not more than 20 uh, uh, you know 20 no the 28 we just have learned about it so eliminate this also uh, eliminate no nothing else to eliminate sir so answer supposed to be and fourth is also wrong we just have understood it, it uh, does it have to penalize no the press council of india has absolutely no power to penalize that's a fact try to remember so one and uh, uh, three are correct the answer has to be only two again this question i would say was a tough one please don't take a risk please don't attempt you can skip this question was a tough one because it's very factual four statements very factual becomes really tough guys that takes us to the question number 19 again we already have mentioned briefly about the tribal advisory council tse that is under the fifth schedule so which statement is correct is something you have to figure out about the tse very interestingly <clears throat> please remember uh, that all the state that ha- that are having the the scheduled areas they are required to establish a tribal advisory council under the fifth schedule right keep remembering under the fifth schedule this tribal advisory council the purpose is the welfare and advancements of the interests of the scheduled tribes it it consists of 12 20 members out of 3/4 uh, of the representatives that we have the governor of the state can make or can also make uh, uh, you know rules with respect to this tribal advisory council especially in terms of uh, the council the member the appointment and all that stuff remember one very interesting thing like a very similar council can be set up in the states having the sts but not having the scheduled areas if president so want this is again a provision this is a kind of power that president has with respect to this uh, this one right this is important if you look at if you come back look what's the problem the problem is with the number look at the option it says there are it consists of 30 members out of 3/4 no it has 20 members out of 3/4 so in this case first being wrong the only option that you have is 20 okay now this question very uh, medium fact based question nothing much to guess you can attempt it on your risk if you have right uh, second statement for many it is going to be easy because of the statement number 2 being the correct one right okay so the last question which is question number 20 now this question talks about the mixed member proportional the mmp system does do we have mmp system in india no in india we does not have indian general elections are based on first past the post system which is also called as the simple majority right but in new zealand we have this so called mixed member proportional system what exactly is that learn that and then we'll come back later talking about the multi mixed member proportional system very interestingly this kind of system actually allows the voter to split their votes or they can give both their votes to one party if they want but what exactly happens every voter has two votes one is the party vote another is the electorate vote 
so the this this kind of system actually allows a candidate to choose from a different party if they don't like the local candidates from their preferred party look at the level of democracy they have in india we are still challenged we are still having situations so in india of course we don't use such mmp system in india we have simply the first past the post system where uh, you don't really have to win 50 plus 1 a uh, number of votes you have to be first among all your competitor that is called first past the post system so yes that's what happens in india if you look at the statements both look very correct any issue uh, there is no issue so uh, yeah remember the country name also so both are correct answer is supposed to be c i would say this was a was a medium one and uh, many people must have attempted this as well but yeah attempt it at your own risk because you really do not have many clues here so uh, that is all from my side guys i hope you have enjoyed the 20 questions uh, please pardon my uh, <clears throat> throat because sometimes after recording things become really tough and difficult so that's all from my side ashish malik signing off uh, my best wishes to all of you see you guys in the next part but uh, don't forget to like the video and do tell us in the comment box how did you like this video if you if you really like it please try to give your feedback on the end of the video thank you so much god bless you take care jai hind jai bharat and yes before you go don't forget to check out the special link of the test series that we are offering at a very very affordable price do check that out as well take care guys god bless you